Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Q&A session. Sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties. We hope that you have a blessed experience as we go through the session today. Over to Dr. Ronald. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, and thank you so much for joining today. And I want to thank God for giving us a renewed opportunity and a privilege to be able to come in his presence. I trust that you have had a blessed day with the Lord and that the Lord has been speaking to you and that seasons of, of prayer and study at his feet have, have been one of an uplifting and an encouraging experience to you. And we thank God for how he's been leading us the truths he's been revealing to us. We thank you for giving us another opportunity to be able to worship the Lord together. Thank you again, friend, for making this choice to be here. Let us just pray um, as we begin today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again. Thank you for the privilege to be able to join hands. Thank you for the open doors that you create for us so that we can be with you and speak to you and hear you speak to us. And we thank you, God, that you never stop appealing to us to live for you. Thank you for the challenges, the struggles, the obstacles that come our way, because in them and through them, you teach us what it means to lean upon the Lord. Thank you so much, dear Father, for this privilege to be able to speak to you and to come to you in prayer as a family. Please guide us today, Father, as we traverse through scripture and as we allow our thoughts. Father, we give them into your hands and we pray, Father, that you would lead our thoughts and guide and direct us in a way that truly magnifies Jesus. We thank you, Father, for all of these heavenly blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege again to be able to meet with all of you friends. Thank you for joining us. And uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a wonderful time when I get to hear from you. And so uh, if you would please bless us by sharing how God has been blessing you and has been speaking to you. Is there, is there someone um, who would like to share how, what God has been doing in your life? Uh, probably a testimony, something about how the studies probably have been a blessing or your individual experience with the Lord lately that has been an encouragement to you. If there's, if there's anybody who'd like to share, anybody who'd like to share, you could just raise your hand down in the option if you know how to use that, or you could just text the host and we could take it from there. Is there someone who'd like to share? All right, Brother Pranit, please, please share. Brother Pranit, are you there? Hello. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for giving me this privilege yes, Lord. to share the wonder, wonderful things which God has done in my life. Thank you, each and, each and every one. Uh, uh, I don't know where to start, but there are wonderful things which have happened in my life through this lockdown period. And through mainly the Bible studies, God really He was uh, leading me in each and every way. And uh, I was just praying to God and uh, I was willing to serve Him. And I don't know how, but uh, one day through Spirit, God spoke with me like, quit, quit your job. Come out, step forward. Mm. I will use you. And uh, I have quit, quit my worldly job. And uh, the very next moment, God uh, is using me in his service. Like I'm uh, working for Amazing Facts through AWR. Mm -hmm. And uh, taking a TV program calls. And uh, I'm really blessed to hear... Uh, Many calls, their testimonies, 
the way god was leading each and every person in their lives and it was really affecting me so much and i cannot even uh, express it in words but i'm really very blessed to do god's work and uh, th- through bible studies and uh, through much prayers i'm happy that god is using me and i want i mean i want to be used more and more in his service mm-hmm. i praise god for this and i thank you each and every one amen amen praise the lord praise the lord uh we'll hear from sister sandhya sister sandhya can you hear me hello yes yes uh yes sir i want to tell some blessings um actually i was have some broken relationship with me there but while i was listening your message i heard god is speaking to me mm-hmm. to um, god is answering me through your speeches mm-hmm. and i have also been afraid in while sleeping at night um wrong wrong thoughts coming but while you have prayed and while watching all these things it has been gone and i was i'm very blessed from your preaching it's uh, like bring positive thought on me and my negative emotion got to uh, slowly slowly down it's ending Crazy. and i'm regretting many times i have not watched your all these things is coming so i'm very happy to hear you are really um, blessed by god Crazy. thank you for Thank you. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. God God bless you abundantly. God bless you abundantly. Uh, praise the Lord. Um we're going to hear from Sister Larisha. Oh, okay, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh I I don't know how to start. Uh from so long I I was thinking I'll say something but I never have the courage. But yes, today I just want to thank the Lord for leading my life my i have experienced so many things uh, bitter things sadness and in my family but i thanked a lot for being there and uh, yes i see god's hand leading my life my family and this worship has really been a blessing for me personally so I really thank God for that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh Sister Asha, please if you would like to share. Yeah, praise God everyone. Just want to share uh the faithfulness of God. Sometimes when we tell and share the love of Christ with someone, it seems like as if you're hitting against a brick wall mm. but uh knowing god for who he is and i thank you so much uh dr ronald for enlightening us bringing us closer to the nature of god and often when i think of the words of jeremiah he says uh, let not a rich man boast of his riches or a strong man of his strength mm. or the wise man of his wisdom but let him boast of only one thing that he knows and he understands me that is to take god at every promise that he has given of course a part of it is our partnership in walking in obedience to his will but just the faithfulness of god now it's been 20 years that i've been here working as a teacher and i remember in my early days i just encountered one of my colleagues who came from a, a very very strong religious background and every time i kind of shared the love of christ with her it was like really hitting my head against a brick wall mm-hmm. but uh, i often remembered it in my prayers just for one reason uh, god says nothing is impossible with him if mm-hmm. the heart of the king is in his hands then the heart of even the people that you're praying for is in his hands and that gave me the courage to uh, you know to persist in prayer and after so many years uh, there have been situations that come into our life that god has turned it around So I just want to encourage my brothers and sisters don't give up praying ever that it's for family or for your friends or whoever God has put a burden in your heart for because he's going to do it 
but we just need to consistently pray. I just want to say thank you, Lord, for being so faithful. And I continue to pray that they will hold on till the end and come to the true revelation of Christ. And I thank you so much for the enlightenment that you're giving us, uh, Dr. Raman. Uh, thank you so much. Just want to encourage you to persevere in prayer. That's it. God thank bless you. So much. Thank you so much, Sister. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Is there, is there still someone else who would like to share? There is still someone else who would like to share how the Lord's been leading you, how he's been speaking to you. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, Sister Charn, please. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Paul. <laughs> Thank you for, for the opportunity to share this. At first, I would like to express my gratitude for this everyday bible study um there were there were times that i wasn't able to attend but i'm so happy that i could always go back to the lesson you know i praise god that through this i i was able to focus more my relationship to god and it also strengthened my relationship to my family mm. to my friends and uh, to my love and I've learned a lot and appreciate more the importance of this. And it really transformed, transformed me in the way. And I pray that I could extend this to others as well. And uh, that God uses me also to, for, for his glorification. And um, I'm always praying. We're always praying for this, this wonderful study. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We thank God. We thank God for how he has been blessing us. Wow. Is there one last person before we go into today's thoughts? Uh, someone else? Someone else who would like to share one last person before we go ahead? Yes. Is there still someone else? Someone else would like to share? Okay. All right, if there's no one, then we will pray one more time. Oh, sorry, Sister Rosie is there. Uh, yes, Sister Rosie, please. Hello, good evening, Doctor. Good evening. Good evening. I, I'm so blessed. I really thank God for using you so mightily and so many people from every corner of the world is watching these Bible studies. It has changed my life and I praise God. But at the same time, I'm going through a great challenge in my life mm. about my son. Mm -hmm. That Fritzula problem is, I'm putting it in the hands of God, asking God for his healing at this time. There is no help from the physicians mm -hmm. and every knock, every nook and corner I went during this time, I was so blessed. I was hearing these messages and something, the Satan has to disturb us from mm. the focus. Mm. And, but still I praise God in all these circumstances because he, he will uphold us in this time. But I pray and I ask each one of you to pray for my son. He's still in pain and in trouble. But I ask that God will do a miracle because they say without surgery, this cannot be done. And here, none of the hospitals are taking. There's no flight to go back to India. There are, I don't know, the hospitals in India also, if they are open. And he's in severe pain. I don't know, tomorrow he has to go to work after a long time, two months. But I pray that God will give him the strength that he needs. 
but I'm really blessed with these messages. It is really powerful. And the way you are focusing our attention and the way you are drawing us to the things that we have never thought and never taken it in this manner or, uh, about God. And I really praise God for using this ministry and the people who are all working behind this to may, God is making you all and for us also successful. And I pray that we will receive this eternal life that we are aiming at. This mm -hmm. is my praises to my God, that only my God can comfort us in this time of trouble. Thank you, Doctor. And thank you all of them who are really, who are really upholding this ministry because it is a blessing to all of us. Thank you very much for your sacrifice. We thank God. And yes, please. Yes. Thank you, doctor. That's all I would say because I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going out in the world, but I have a great burden in my heart because I know what I cannot bear to see at home. Also, my son and the the devil has put so much of things to do in the home that uh, I cannot even concentrate in studying the lessons that you are teaching us properly because of the, you know the circumstances that I'm undergoing but mm -hmm. I know God will really come and save all of us because I'm just wondering that in the last days when God will pour out the Holy Spirit I think only we will have by God's Spirit we will have to heal people because there are no physicians at this time to attend to the people who are really suffering so this is my cry to God Lord who are, this is what you're going to teach us that in the last days we have to be prepared for the Holy Spirit because there won't be any physician to uh, to do anything for anybody who are suffering and I can see the pain that my son is going through and I can see the trouble around the world so that's why I say that's why God is going to pour out his spirit in a double portion for all of us and I think we have to be really changing lives in the lives of people which will be healed even they will be suffering so much because there is no attendance for many physicians. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I understand that it's a heavy time for you and your family. We just want to pause and, and pray for your family at this time and pray that the one who we speak about is not just a physician, but he is really the one who John 5 says seeks to rest not just his physical well-being, but his wholeness upon his people. And so we want to claim that blessing for you and your family. So uh, let us all join in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Father, thank you for even in the times of crisis, you put upon the lips of your children praises for their eternal father. And Father, you are teaching then your children that even through dark and difficult times, they are to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, the light of the world. And we thank you, God, for giving us this privilege to come together as a family where brothers and sisters can share their burdens, they can share their struggles and challenges, and also praise God for he is worthy of our praise. Thank you so much, Father. We pray for this Rosie and the family, and we pray, God, that you will please bless the dear son, and we are pleading that for your glory, a miracle would be done, that he would get up from that bed of illness, to tell the world, I serve an able God. Father, I pray that this miracle for your glory would be a turning point for him and the family. May it be a turning point for many others whom he will witness to. We pray that Jesus will be magnified, O oh dear God. And we pray, Lord, Father, that no matter what happens then in this home, no matter how many tragedies and calamities come upon them, I pray that their eyes would never be moved from you and that they would be witnesses for you even in a time of crisis. Glory be to your name. You are truly faithful. You are always able. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
thank you so much. Thank you so much, friends. Um, the moments like this allow you to see that uh, life is real. Life is real. And while we may be sitting behind screens and listening through speakers, uh, it is it is such a blessing to be able to know that God is speaking to his people and that even through difficult situations, his comfort is real and his, and his presence is near. I want to begin by taking this question from, uh, from the questions that have come in. It's found in Psalm 34 and verse 18. Uh, Stanley asks the question, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are of a contrite spirit. And Brother Stanley's question is, what does brokenhearted mean? And how can we differentiate with that of the secular world? Uh, Brother Stanley, I will only put in my effort to understand uh, what you mean there by, uh, by, by its understanding in the secular world. Now, when you look at it in, in scripture, in Psalm 34, 18, you find uh, the precious words of comfort. The words of comfort we often stand in need of. And the Bible says that the Lord is nigh unto them. Uh, we also find in Psalm 145 and verse 18, a similar words as the Bible begins in Psalm 145 and verse 18 by saying, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. So we have that text as well, the, the Lord is nigh unto his children, those who call upon him in truth. We also find that the Bible says that the Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart. And I'd like to read to you what the Bible says in Psalm 51, you know, that penitent psalm by, by the psalmist. Uh, notice what it says in Psalm 51 and verse 17. It says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. And that's a, that's, that, that's a, that's a wonderful text for consideration. There, the Bible says, those are the sacrifices of the Lord, that the gifts we give to the Lord, that the offerings that we present to the Lord are a, a broken spirit. Uh, the word broken there in Psalm 51 and verse 17 speaks of that which it has burst open. It also speaks of broken hearted. It, seem, it, it speaks of the heart that is crushed, a heart that's destroyed, a heart that is deeply wounded, a, a heart that is torn, a heart that has gone through a, a severe tragedy. It, it, it's, it's implying all of those words as we speak about that, a broken spirit. And it also speaks of a broken and a contrite heart. And so when we read those words that the Lord is nigh unto them that are brokenhearted, it's speaking of those who are going through that very difficult, very oppressive, uh, the crushed experience, the tragedies of life. And oftentimes, friends, there are tragedies that you can't explain. And the songwriter says that in those moments when you can't see his, when you, when you can't see his hand, you are to trust his heart. And friends, what's amazing about that is, as we've already covered in our previous studies, that the Lord wants us to be on the rock. Uh, speaking of the wise man who was already built on the rock when the floods came. And the reason why God wants us to be established in him is so that when the storms of life come, we still find our footing and our foundation in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that's a very, very important lesson. And so the Bible nonetheless tells us that no matter what we may be experiencing, no matter how hard the times may be, moments that we can't put an explanation, or I also want to say to you, friends, even in moments when you know this is self-inflicted pain, these wounds are self-infliction, these are the consequences of my own wrongdoing, even in those moments, friends, the Bible says the Lord cares enough to be near. The Lord cares enough to be near you even in those times. And so that's, that's how we understand. Uh, now, now, I don't know, Brother Stanley, if I can make complete sense of, of, of what you mean when you say, how can we differentiate that with that of a secular world? Now, in the secular world experience, if you have been in, let's say, a secular transaction 
which has caused you loss and your heart is broken, guess what? The Lord is near you even in that time. He doesn't forsake you and walk away from you because you're experiencing the consequence of your sin. Perhaps you may be sitting in prison for what you have done wrong. The Lord is near you to comfort you. And if you submit to him, he will use that experience to turn you to himself. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that all things work together for good. Notice, friends, the Bible doesn't say all good things work together for good. The Bible says all things, all things work together for good if we allow them, if we allow the Lord. If we allow the Lord to enter our hearts, he will take even the most broken, the most destitute, the most desolate of conditions and turn them into a beautiful experience. It is his promise, as he says in the Bible, that I will make streams flow out in the desert. God is so much able to be able to do that. And so I want to leave, though, leave you with those thoughts. Uh, and I trust that they are of some comfort. And I hope that it brings some uh, clarity to, to the, what you're looking for. Uh, we find another question that's come in. Many Christians stress the importance of memorizing scripture, especially at the end of time. But what scriptures must be memorized? What scriptures must be memorized? Uh, I remember we were uh, traveling with uh, my good friend, Pastor Skeet, and someone asked him that question. Another brother had asked him that question, uh, or rather, they were speaking about speaking about you know places he's not been because he's traveled so extensively, and he was speaking of this place you know where he's not been, and we were saying, oh, I think they they take away your Bibles. You, you're not allowed to carry a Bible in that country or something. And and Pasquit's response was, you know, they can take the Bible away from me, but how do they take that which is already in memory? How do they take away the Bible that's already committed to memory? And so uh, it is an important time. The, the stress is indeed, indeed to be able to put passages to, to, to memory for there is soon coming a time, friends, when we will not have the luxury, uh, leave alone these uh, technological mediums through which we're able to converse and, and they work as a conduit for us to be able to, to communicate. But there's coming a time when, when all of this is going to be taken away from us. And friends, when that moment Moment comes, uh, God wants you, as the songwriter says, that you are to be found standing on the promises of God. Now, that's something for you, dear friend, to begin with. Uh, for, the, for your question is, what scriptures must be memorized? And, and that's probably a good starting point. Uh, you could put the texts that speak of God's promises to his children. That's, those are texts to be able to commit to memory. Put texts to memory that speak of God's character. I think those are powerful texts. In essence, what I would really say to you, put, put all of scripture to memory. Uh, but we're giving you something to begin with. Take the texts that speak of God's character. And as the psalmist says, we are to store these words in our heart. As you, as you put these texts that speak of God's character, you, you, are, you are better developing a relationship with the Lord. You are you are then constantly meditating, as God says to Joshua, upon him day and night, upon his character day and night. And as you behold his character in those passages, by beholding, you too shall, shall become changed. And that's God's promise. That is indeed God's promise to his people. So I hope that, I hope that, that, I hope that, that brings uh, some thought to it, some thought to it. All right, we're going to take another question here. Um, well, there's a question that comes in that says, in the judgment day, we're going to view all our sins. Does include the sins which you had repented and had been forgiven with? Uh, well, there are various texts in scripture that speak to us about uh, what God seeks to do with sin. As we read, um, for instance, you could come with me to the book of Psalms and notice what the Lord says in Psalm 103 and verse 12. The Bible says in Psalm 103 verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So they're, they're, they're gone. Uh, we need to remember that for that is the promise of the Lord. He says, you know, those sins are gone. Uh, we're, also, we're also told, and we just looked at this, we just looked at this um, two passages, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. We just looked at this yesterday. 
Acts 3.19, it says when the time of refreshing shall come, your sins are going to be blotted out. So they're going to be, sins are going to just be removed. They're going to be taken away. Uh, we also read in Jeremiah 50 and verse 20, notice what the Lord says, Jeremiah 50 and verse 20, these powerful words where it says, in those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for and there shall be none. The sins of Judah and there shall not be found. So there will be a looking for of sins, but they will not be found. Uh, they will not be even brought to remembrance as, as we were studying yesterday. And that, that it's just going to be such a powerful time. So we believe that, yes, there will be sins that there will be no record for because they're wiped away. They're, they're, they're clean. And the Lord says, you know, he is going to blot them out. As far as the east is from the west, he's going to take them away. So they are not going to be brought up. They're not going to be discussed. They're not going to be brought back to remembrance, not going to be brought back to, to recollection. So yes, they will be gone. We will not see them. We will not see them. As we get right with him, that's, that's, isn't that what the Bible says to us in, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, when the Bible says if we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So that is the promise of the Lord. It is, a, it is a, a question of his faithfulness. And he says he is faithful to forgive. So if we confess before him, if we get right with him, he wipes the record clean. And that is his promise. That is just his promise. So I hope that helps too. Um, there's another question that comes in that is asking about Melchizedek and I want to look at the passage in question found in Hebrews chapter 7. And the Bible says in verse 3, that is the question that is being raised. What does this passage mean in Hebrews 7, 3, where it says, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So notice how... Abram is, uh, weird, rather, Melchizedek is described uh, in, in very, very unique fashion um, as you read about him in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3, uh, probably to bring a greater thought or reflection to Melchizedek, uh, we, it would do us well to go to the Old Testament to take a look at him and then see how that connects with what is being spoken of. In Hebrews chapter 7, if you're, if you're in your Bibles, you could go with me to Genesis chapter 14 and notice the words that are being spoken about Melchizedek. Uh, Hebrews, uh, Genesis rather, he, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. Notice what the Bible says. Genesis 14, 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So it's very interesting that Melchizedek is the king of Salem, and he brings forth bread and wine. Now, that's very, very interesting. And as he comes out, he blesses Abram, and that's what he's doing. And it's so interesting to note, friends, that that becomes such a picture of Jesus. One, he is king. Just, just look, at, look at what the Bible is saying in the New Testament, how he serves as a type of Christ. So look at all these things about the information that is given to us about Melchizedek that we can glean from and see how, how Scripture speaks of him in the likeness of Christ. So notice in Genesis 14, verse 18, he is king, but he is also priest. Now that's interesting. Jesus is our a king, our king of kings, as Isaiah would say. And he, uh, Jesus, at the same time, is also our high priest, as the book of Hebrews will, will tell us. So Jesus is our king. He's also our priest. Interestingly, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And it's interesting that in 1 Corinthians 1, Christ is described as, as the one who has made righteousness to us. So Christ, our righteousness. Christ is our priest. Christ is our king. Notice, interestingly, also in Genesis 14, 18, Melchizedek comes forth with bread and wine. And that's so reminiscent of Christ at the table giving uh, the disciples the bread and wine. And so 
uh, there, there are powerful coming togethers as we, as we look at the life of Melchizedek. Uh, going into Hebrews 7, you will find even more. Uh, notice how he is described uh, uh, in Hebrews 7, verse 2, to whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, as we just mentioned. And after that, also king of Salem, who is king of peace. So that, that's, I mean, Jesus is described as the prince of peace. And so it, all of this is very interesting. Uh, we also read he's, he's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And so Melchizedek is also that, that figure who just appears. You know, there seems to be no trace of his genealogy, but he just appears onto the scene. And, and in, 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 in a certain effect, we see that Jesus shares some similarity to that in the sense that Jesus was the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hovered over Mary and Jesus was born. It wasn't human intervention. And so in a sense, Jesus just appears in the sense that, you know, Melchizedek appears and there, you know, there's sort of no trace. Although, yes, you can trace Mary and Joseph's genealogy, but, but in, terms of, in terms of Jesus, you know, showing up, uh, he, he appears, he comes off, he comes onto the scene uh, sort of like, like Melchizedek and we sort of can't, can, can fully put a, put a, put a description to it. Uh, similarly in Hebrews 7 verse 3, we also find that there is neither beginning of days nor end of life. It also gives you that, that, that essence of eternity uh, about Melchizedek, again, sort of pointing us to, to that greater Melchizedek who's Jesus. So note that Melchizedek is not Christ. But Melchizedek serves as a type of Christ, as a picture of Christ. Uh, notice something else also. Uh, we, you can keep reading in Hebrews 7. Um, and we read in verse 5, it says, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who serve, who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the Lord as of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Uh, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So notice Melchizedek doesn't seem to be coming out of the tribe of Levi, and yet he is a priest who receives who receives the tithes from Abraham. In a similar way, Jesus also was not from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of, of, of Judah. And yet Jesus was accepted. Jesus was the priest who is our great high priest, even though not coming from the line of Line of Levi. So there is there are, there are all those connections. There are all those connections that that speak to us about about Melchizedek uh, in a relationship to Jesus. So I, I hope that I hope that shines some light on on that thought. There's another question that has come in about Abraham and Sarah, and it says if Abraham and Sarah would have in vitro fertilization, would that still have been fulfillment of God's promise? Now, friends, that is quite a question. I just want to admit that off the top, that that is quite a question. I've actually never heard that. Uh, but if Abraham and Sarah would have had, would have gone through uh, this medical procedure described in vitro fertilization, also also known in, I guess, in medical realms as assisted reproductive technique. And so we speak of that. Um, let's, let's speak about, let's speak first about the issue at hand. And I want us to understand how important this is. I, I really want us to be able to make sense of this. And that is that we all first need to be able to understand that this was a very critical moment in Abraham and, and Sarah's life. They were longing for a child. They were really longing for a child. I mean, they, they've, been, they've been of age. Abram's name is exalted father, and yet he has no children. I mean, this must have borne heavy upon them. Uh, in some of our societies today, as in comparison to perhaps other societies, which may not be, which may not be so much in other places, uh, what what you may perhaps describe as a stigma, a mark of disgrace, uh, it may not be perhaps like that in certain societies, but in some societies, it is indeed a stigma 
uh, in some cases, I guess people would even consider you cursed to not have a child. Uh, this can create all kinds of pressures upon a family. Uh, this could create even marital tensions. And so the, first off, you want to understand that individuals, couples who, who would opt for such assistive techniques, would, uh, would opt for such methods, I want to just backtrack here and, and rewind here and step back here. And before beginning to talk about all these, this method involved, you want to step back and before passing a final word, I hope friends, you also understand how it feels to be in that situation. I hope you understand the pain that is involved, the pressures that is involved. It is very important to not ignore the human emotion that is involved. It's easy for us to sit in our position, in our comfortable position perhaps, and be able to pass a statement saying it is right or wrong. But it is very important that we understand the struggle, the pain, the, the, the pressure that one would go through, that a family would go through in such a time. And so we want to recognize that. Secondly, you want to understand that as a married couple, as, a, as married individuals, you need a home. You need a family that is centered in the Lord. So that no matter, no matter what comes your way, you are constantly led, not by desires, but rather you are led as the Lord leads you that you are led not just in the pursuit of a child, you are led in the pursuit of the perfect will of the Lord. I hope friends, I, I hope that, that that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not taking away from you the desire to have a child. I pray that you may seek the Lord, that if there is a struggle, there is a challenge for some reason in the family that, that there hasn't been that cry of a child heard in the home and, and, and if, if the womb seems to be closed for some reason, one needs to realize where you stand with the Lord. Let, let, let us get our hearts right with the Lord. And before seeking anything else, let us seek the Lord. Before seeking medical attention, let us seek the one who has been seeking our attention all this while. Thirdly, I'd like to point out, friends, that the ultimate purpose, the ultimate purpose as, as the Bible would describe it, the, as the psalmist would describe it so beautifully. Um, notice what the Bible says in Psalm 127. And I am reading uh, Psalm 127 in verse 3. It says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So friends, we want to understand that this is God's reward. In other words, if it is of the Lord, then it needs to be used for the Lord. In other words, in other words, as you spend time with the Lord and the Lord reveals that it is indeed his perfect will for your family to have a child, then friends, are you completely willing to, like, 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 like Hannah, to be able to say, Lord, I will surrender this child because if this child is yours, this child is to be used for the glory of God. This child will be solely dedicated to the glory of God. As parents, as, as, a, husband, as a husband and wife, do you take that very sacred responsibility? In fact, brothers and sisters, we are told that if we do not have that understanding, if the husband and wife are not right with the Lord as two individuals, it is in fact a sin to increase the family. It is a sin to increase the family when you yourselves cannot guarantee your child a, a safe spiritual upbringing. It is a sin to increase the family. It is a sin to be having a child. Uh, keeping the whole, keeping keeping the whole assisted technique uh, completely aside. Speaking of just having a child, even by regular means, this is very important. I hope we all really, really understand. If marriage is to the glory of God, friends, then having children also is to the glory of God. This is not just to satisfy some societal norm. 
This is not just to satisfy some familial pressure. Marriages and children, families, friends are to be to the glory of God. I hope the husband and wife have really, really taken that into, into consideration because it is not something that can simply be overlooked or looked away or ignored. This is a very, very special, special concept. If that is the case and the husband and wife realize their sacred responsibilities in raising a child in the direction and in the will of the Lord. And then, friends, we find that to this godly couple, there seems to be a, a, a struggle in, in childbearing. <clears throat> the, the best thing about that time, the best thing about that time is because their hearts are right with the Lord, they will have the peace of God that will flood their soul. That is the best thing about it. And friends, often it can be that such an experience can actually cause, as we studied yesterday, can bring a shaking. Everything seemed to be going well, and this brings a shaking and leads individuals to seek the Lord. I remember several years ago when I was in dental college, there was a, 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 a doctor that came to, to share a lecture. And as he came to share a lecture, he's speaking about, you know, how, how he's accomplished so well and his practice, I guess, well-established and he was showing pictures and all of that. And then as he ended his presentation, he showed us a picture of his son. And he was, he, was, he was sharing how his son was born with this disability. And I guess he was saying something to the effect that that was what humbled him. I think that's, that's what I took away, that that in spite of all, you know, he's, he's got this great practice and he's, he's, he's got everything established. It was that experience, I guess, that really humbled him. And so, friends, often challenging experiences and difficult situations really, really allow the character to be tested, allow one's relationship to be tested. And, and, and in fact, your marriage is put to the test. And you see... And you see that if you two are in the Lord, friends, I believe that that bond between the husband and wife can even get stronger in such a time as they lean together upon the Lord in such a situation. That is one. I'd like to now go into the particular process and procedure in question, which is in vitro fertilization. Uh, for those of you to whom the, 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 you probably heard the term and, and like myself, didn't know much about it. Uh, in vitro, uh, from the Latin, simply means in a glass, that which is done in a glass, whether a petri dish, a test tube, whatever, done in, a, done in a glass. In vitro, that's what the literal word from the Latin means. Now, in vitro fertilization is, it, it's, it's actually a series of procedures. Uh, I guess when you read it, it just perhaps maybe just seems like one step, but it's a series of procedures, and, and the purpose of the series of procedures is to, is to help with fertility problems. Uh, and Mayo Clinic uh, in the U.S. It tries to describe the process, and I'm just, I'm just going to share, share what, I've, what, I've, what I've been gleaning from them. Uh, notice, notice what else is, and as, as, I looked through, as I looked through how IVF, uh, which is the, the acronym that's used for in vitro fertilization, IVF, Here's the thing about it, and, and I want to just get to the core of it. The thing about it is you take mature eggs. You take the mature eggs from a woman's ovary, and they're put on this, on this glass, on, on, this, on this dish, and then they're fertilized by sperm in a lab, sperm from a male uh, in a lab. Now, this, this also raises many questions because now, in speaking about in speaking about ethics, in speaking about the, the questions of, of, of morality and ethics are raised when we when we speak about certain things. For instance, there is the case of, of people receiving, for instance, women who've passed a certain age limit um, and their, their partners have also passed a certain age limit. They are recommended, I guess, to be able to take uh, the sperm from a donor rather than their own partner who is of age. And so that is some that suggestion and that that in itself is questionable. That in itself is questionable. 
uh, it was interesting. Um, Sood was pointing out the other time how how I, perhaps some have looked at 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 what Abraham and Hagar's relationship was as that of surrogacy, and and friends, I mean that as that. I mean, just by looking at it morally raises some big questions. I mean, of course, from Abraham's standpoint, it was it was it was sin. Um, quite simply put, one because one because you know he is already in a wedded relationship, and to breach that by going into another woman while you know you're married to this individual. But then you are to be in bed with another person. I mean, that in itself is a is an attack on the very foundation, on the very experience of of what a marital vow actually deals with. And Abraham should have been more more discerning on that, being the man of God that he is. So we 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 understand that that's very crucial. Secondly, it was God's promise. And if God had promised it was going to be God's way, not Abraham's way, or Sarah's way, or Hagar's way, it was going to be God's way. Now, friends, it's really amazing that God has allowed us to see, right before our eyes today, what happens when we take matters into our hands rather than surrendering the matters into God's hands. And so Abraham tried to have his own way, what some may call the Hagar as a surrogate mother who was simply bearing the child. Friends, don't tell me that, that there was no affection, there was no bond. Uh, first off, I mean, it, it, it's just wrong. They were, they were in, a married man being in bed with this woman. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. It, it is a sin. Uh, secondly, for him to be able to experience this, um, it brought later on pain even for himself. Because Sarah later on realizing, you know, the, 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 the strife that it had created, it, as, she, as she realized, you know, by experiencing the, the painful results of her decision, she then tells Abram to let this woman go, let the bond woman go, and God sides with her. That's the, that's the, that's the deep end of this, this, this thought, that God actually sides with Sarah's decision and says, Abram, yep, you've got to let her go. You've got to let her go. Abraham learned the hard way what happens? He, he had to experience this deep pain of letting his son go. He loved Ishmael. And I, and I, and I don't want to believe that he had no love for Hagar. I, 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 I can't believe that. I can't believe that he had no affection for Hagar. No. He's, 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 he's given her, he's given Abram a child. Uh, I don't think you can tell me that there was, there was no relationship there. And so the whole question of surrogacy is raised. Now, there's another, there's, there, 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 are, there is a parallel challenge that's found both in surrogacy and in in vitro fertilization. And that's what I want to raise up at this point. And that is as mature eggs are, are, are collected from the ovaries of a woman and fertilized by the sperm in a lab, then that fertilized egg, a result of the sperm fertilizing the egg, the, the embryo from the the, the fertilized egg, which is then described as an embryo, uh, the egg that is taken from the woman, then fertilized by the sperm, which becomes an embryo, then, if then even if there are more eggs, there are more eggs that are pursued, there are more embryos that are created, the greater question then raises, um, and, this, and this, is an, this is an ethical concern, and, and it's really interesting, as, as I was just going through Mayo Clinic, you know, trying to describe it, they're actually speaking of this, and I'm, and I'm so glad, actually, that, you know, they speak about this, because the question is asked, they literally ask the question, um, and I really like it. I really like their, 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 their straightforwardness with this. They ask the question, what do you do with the rest? What do you do with the, the rest of the, the eggs that are, that, are, that are already fertilized, the eggs that have already been fertilized by the sperm? Because if there are more embryos that are created, that will be then placed back into in, in into the lady, what do you do with the others that have already been fertilized and have already developed? And so what do you do with these fertilized eggs? Where do they actually go? So that, that question is raised as well. Um, there are the challenges of also knowing that if you, if you actually put more than, more than one fertilized egg back into the woman, there is the danger 
especially if a woman is increased in age, there is a, there is a danger of, of of having you know all those complications associated with with that multiple birth. And so another step is is suggested the step called a technical term, and and I'm just going to give the technical term and then tell you what it really is. The technical term is fetal reduction. So if there are if there are multiple fetuses that are developed as a result of the multiple eggs that were placed, that were fertilized, if that happens, then uh, there is a process that is followed that's called fetal reduction. And uh, to simply put it, what it is, is to kill the extra fetuses. And so to just keep one, um, which would be, which would be literally, para, which would literally be killing, which would literally be murder. You're, you're killing that, that, that fetus, you're killing that child. You're, you're taking away life. Uh, so the, again, a uh, technical term uh, given to that, to that process. But then uh, consider something else with me. Uh, what do you do with all the extra embryos? And, and so Mayo Clinic suggests that you, know, you can freeze them for future use. But what if you're not planning to use, to have, use, to have any more ch children further? Uh, and I like their honesty because they also go on to say not all embryos will survive the freezing and thawing process, although most will. So there are no guarantees that yes, the, the embryos will actually survive the, the whole cryopreservation experience. So this is very interesting. This is very interesting. So what do you do with these developed eggs, these fertilized eggs rather, what do you do with them? You, you end up you know, throwing them away. So you take that, take a, a, you select out of N and then who gives us the right to select? Who gives the right, right to select that this will make it and this will not? Uh, it's sort of like playing God. So friends, that's the challenge of in vitro fertilization and if you ask me then, would that be a fulfillment of God's promise? My answer would be no. Considering, considering that, considering this process, considering the dangers, and, 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 and what if in Abraham and Sarah's case, if they were very, very poor, I, I don't believe in vitro fertilization is a very cheap process. Uh, so what about those who can't afford? So in other words, the promise of God is only for the rich, but not for the poor. It raises it raises these questions as well, ethical questions about you know what happens with the rest. What about fetal reduction when you realize, oh this is this is now 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 at hand, and we were expecting only one child, but now multiple fetuses have developed. So what do we do? You know we we kill which one to choose, which one to leave. I mean, who decides all of these things? And I and I was saying to you that there's a parallel concern in in the in in the world of surrogacy as well. I was watching the um, uh, news the other day and. They were speaking about how certain mothers are made surrogate mothers and and people rejoice, I guess, when they see, you know, the mother finally bear child, the couples are happy, they they want to receive that child. But then there are also reports that when children are born with disability, then those parents want nothing to do with the child. And so now those childs have, have had to go into orphanages and all of that stuff. But wait, I mean, what about that? I mean... If you if you wanted to go down that route, if you wanted to go down that route and take that take that route of, of receiving a child, then the child that came, you are to receive it. So wait, it's only God's promise when the child is normal. But if the, if the child is born with some sort of disability, then you reject God's promise. I mean, you know, we we want to ask these we want to ask these important questions. I want to come back to the thought, friends, that it's easy for me to sit again behind the screen and speak about this, but the pain that a family experience of not having a child is real. It's painful. It is heart-wrenching. And it would be improper for us to, to just pass a word and cut people off. We are to understand the challenges people go through, and we are to take people to God's word and be able to help them see light in the, in, the, in the sight of God's word. I want to read to you these very powerful words that come to us from Psalm 139 about the, about the sacredness of life, about the sacredness of life. Um, I, have, I, have other, I have other personal concerns with such, with such matters as well. Um, for instance, the partner then is, is, is expected 
to artificially and see this is this is my other concern the partner is expected to artificially actually masturbate to be able to produce that semen he is expected to do that uh, that's that's one of the techniques apart from apart from the fact that it can be it can just be extracted from his testicles the yeah. the other option is to actually be able to masturbate and so this is just i mean the whole the whole thing raises some very very disturbing questions and and one wants to be careful one wants to be careful talking about the sacredness of life you know in this choice of you know which egg stays and which egg goes and fetal reduction and all of that notice what the bible says in psalm 139 and I'd like to read for you this passage, Psalm 139. And the Bible says in verse 13, Psalm 139, verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Notice this, notice what the psalmist is saying. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is, this is the psalmist speaking about about a child in the womb. And, and notice the language that's being employed there. It says, thou has possessed my reins. In other words, you have created, you have purchased, you, it, is, it, is, it is, you have owned my reins. You have, you have owned my mind. You know, the, the word actually literally means even a kidney. In other words, that that essential organ. He says, "Lord, you've possessed like my 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 little my little organs. You've you've possessed them. You 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 own them." He says, "Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb." God is that fence. The the word is translated. The word "covered" is translated as, as God is that fence in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Then notice this. In verse 15 of Psalm 139, the psalmist says, My substance was not hid from thee. Hmm. My body, in other words, was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Check this out. My, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought. Very interesting. That word curiously wrought means I was embroidered. The word means to be embroidered, it, 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 means, uh, it means by implication to be fabricated, to be, to be curiously worked upon, needlework, embroidered. Uh, notice God has divinely, life is so sacred. God, in the, notice that language, that I was made in secret, in the mother's womb, in the fertilization of that egg, in secret I was made. And God, you are the one who were, who were the embroiderer of my life. You were the one who fabricated. You were the one who made all of this. Just as he molded, molded when, he, when he made man, he, he made him out of the dust of the ground. God is personally involved in this. Verse 16 of Psalm 139, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. In other words, I was, I was still that, that unformed mass. Uh, in other words, when that when you read that word, you saw my substance yet being unperfect. It's awesome to read that. It's the word is literally talking about being wrapped, as in like that egg, like that embryo. That's what it's talking about. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being an embryo, yet being that egg. In other words, life is being described even at that embryonic level. And it goes on to say, in thy book, all my members were written. In thy book, all the members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Friends, I hope you're catching what the psalmist is saying about the sacredness of life. Even at the embryonic stage, the psalmist says, Lord, your eyes did see me when I was wrapped up in that egg. You saw me there. You're the one who fabricated it. And so, friends, we want to realize the sacredness of life and always be able to respect it. And we, and I want, and I want to say this, there is, there is assistance we can seek in reproduction. I also want to be careful 
that we don't hit the extremes in these situations as well. There is assistance we can seek in reproduction. And what I mean by that is meet a good godly doctor who could guide you, who could give you counsel on how to prepare yourself, how to prepare your body to get ready for the experience of childbirth. You can speak to a godly doctor. I, I, I have a dear friend, Dr. Austin, and and, and I, I mean, I, when I speak to him, I mean, it's such a blessing. I mean, I hear such wonderful words of wisdom. He's, he's been a wonderful brother. In fact, he, he just had a child recently. And it, it's so powerful to be able to have godly counsel. So surround yourself with, with individuals who are close to the Lord. Preferably find a good godly doctor. I can suggest one right to you, Dr. Austin. Find a good godly doctor. You have Dr. Raj and others. Uh, godly men who love the Lord and also have an understanding of, 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 these, of these deep technical medical situations. Speak to them as to how they could tell you what a, a certain diet you could be on, uh, what certain dietary intakes you need to increase as you get ready for. So there is a place for intervention. There is a place where, where, where all this help and guidance can help you in the it, it, and assist you in the process, but we want to we want to draw the line and say no further, because where things begin to cross the bounds of God, we want to be careful that we are individuals who are not fabricated by a lab. We are individuals, the Bible says, who are fabricated by God, embroidered by God, put together and pieced together by God. And so, brothers and sisters, I I hope that 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 sheds some light on on the subject as well. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. I never looked at it and you asking the question has, has allowed me to, to look at the subject as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think we're gonna close there and uh, I'm gonna close with a prayer. We're gonna take, I think, prayer requests. We can take prayer requests as well, but right, I'm suggested I can take more questions. I am going to see, yes, let's see. There's another question that comes to us. All right. Um, somebody asked the question. The Bible clearly told us not to eat unclean food, etc. My question is, I have seen many Adventist believers rearing unclean animals like dog, cat, etc. as a pet indirectly getting benefit like love and affection as well as guarding from theft at night, etc. from them. Is it okay to keep those unclean animals to keep it at our homes? Now friends, I, I hope you realize God respects all manners of life. In fact, you'd be amazed how the Bible actually speaks about the comfort we should bring to animals. The rest, the mental rest, we should be offering animals. And so, God has prohibited the consumption of, of uh, he has made a distinction between clean and unclean foods. Um, in, in keeping a dog and a, and, and a pet, I believe is, is, is not an aberration, is not the destruction uh, of that law because it's speaking of food. And, and, and I've seen, I have a friend, I have a personal friend who, who, who really, really, who really, really loves animals. And, really cares for animals. And so I, I'd, like to, I'd like to just mention that, that in taking, in having a pet, in having a pet and caring for them and receiving the joy of, you know, being with that pet, I don't think in any way is, a, is, an, is an aberration of that law that's speaking specifically about food and, and not about having an animal as a pet. And so that's the distinction, that's the distinction. Um, there's another question that's asked in these modern times. There are so many, many small mixer of ingredients, or mixture of ingredients, I think you mean, such as coffee, tea, cocoa, and biscuit, and lobster, crab flavor in noodles, and the junk food which are unclean and not to be touched. Kindly suggest as how to overcome such eatables and items available in the market. Uh, friend, I think, I think you've, there's, an, there's an answer to the question in your question. Uh, as you label it junk food, uh, the way to overcome is to stay away from junk food. Uh, the way to overcome all of these mixtures of ingredients, all of these questionable items, the, the safest 
the safest measure to take is to just stay away from them for good. To stay away from them from, from things that you know are going to cause injury to your body. The safest measure is to stay away from them, to cut off from them completely, so as to, as to keep yourself safe. Um, one, one thing that can really help us to, to appreciate this is to understand God's will for people, God's will for his children. There's a reason why God prescribed a certain diet in scripture. There's a reason why God creates man and then tells him right away what he is expected to eat. And so friends, when you look at it from that spiritual standpoint, and we've covered this in our previous studies, and you could, you could refer back to our previous question and sessions to, to catch on that as well. But it is the reality that as you look at these things from the spiritual standpoint, of how God prescribes that diet, which is really for the spiritual upkeep as well, for a sick body is not able to glorify God. A body that's constantly weakened is not able to do more and most for God's glory. And so we want to take that into consideration and do the most that we can, do the most that we can to be able to consume that which glorifies God. That ties in, friend, with your next question that says a lot of chemicals are sprayed to healthy fruits so that they ripen faster as well as it, to keep them for a longer period of time, to sell them off and to reduce the loss for the seller. My question is, should we eat them even though we know that the fruits are chemically sprayed, which is very harmful to our health and in long consumption, it will lead a more serious complication of, of in a long run. So is it a sin to consume such fruits? Well, friends, the reality is this, that if these are foods God has prescribed in the Bible, and this is, this is just utmost, this is key, the best method, the best method as, as, as is revealed to us is that we should be growing our own food. That's like, that's the ideal. That's the idea. That's, that is God's desire, that God's people be able to be able to even grow food for themselves. But friends, the, the next step is that as as we get these fruits and that's what's available, if there's an individual that this is what they can afford, they can't afford all the organically grown fruit, uh, food and all of that, if they cannot afford that, if this is what's available, then I, I, I don't say to that individual, no, eat only organic or don't eat it at all because it is a sin to eat it. Because the reality is if this person is in keeping with the law of God, with the mandates of scripture, with what God reveals in scripture as to the diet that is to your, to your best of health, then you are in keeping with, with the law that God has set forward for you. As you do this, yes, it may be sprayed upon by all of these things, but if that's what's available, if that's what, is, what you can afford, God sees your circumstance. And the thing about these fruits that may have received that spray or may have received that toxin, uh, in, in, in some form or manner, God sees that that's what you can afford. And God's blessing, friend, is on that diet because that's a diet God has prescribed. Some people take the other extreme and, hey, animals also receive all these toxins and plants are also receiving all these toxins. I might as well eat animals. Well, you see, friends, then you're, you're, you're going against, you know, the consumption of either unclean foods there, saying that, you know, I'll eat unclean foods because, you know, what's the difference? The difference is one is prohibited, one, one is against the word of God, and one is in keeping with the word of God. And so as you do what God says to the best of your ability, and you can't afford beyond that, God sees your, your limits. God, God, God sees that you are doing the best that you can in your strength. And there is a blessing upon that chemically sprayed food, whether you believe me or not, there is a blessing of God upon that fruit and he takes care of it because he sees the situation that you are in. He doesn't curse that fruit. He, he, he makes sure that he makes it a blessing for, for the people who are consuming it. So I hope, that, I hope that that brings some clarity as well. So I'm going to stop there and let's close with a prayer there and we're going to take, I think, prayer requests after that. Let us, let us close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you 
for your goodness, your grace, your mercies that are ever present upon us. Thank you for the truth that is in your word. And thank you for not taking the truth away from us. Thank you, Father. There is no reason why we should be unguided. We should be left lost or confused. We thank you, God, because in coming to you, all darkness is dispelled and light shines upon our path. Thank you for the privilege to come to you today. And we pray, God, that as we sit in your presence day after day, may you allow us to see you like we've never seen you before. Thank you, Father. Bless my brothers and sisters and fill them with your Holy Spirit, that they will love you and serve you with every ounce of their being. Father, may you continue to be the answer to your children's questions and the solution to their problems. We thank you so much in Jesus' name.